So, so Jeremy, uh, it's been a long time since we talked. Um, yes. Actually, um, it's been since last June. <laughs> so, um, you know, yes. let's do a quick uh, sort of uh, uh, introduction for, for each of us, and then we'll, we'll talk about the topic that we have, and we'll try to keep it under uh, uh, 15 minutes or so that we talk about the, the topics that we're, that we're working on. So, um, so go for it. I'll let you introduce okay. yourself. Okay, my name is Jerry Simeon. I'm a Louisiana historian and a collector of material culture with a special focus on portraiture and more specialized still, Creole portraits. So, And uh, I'm Nick Douglas, and I'm a Creole author, and um, I uh, write regularly about uh, the subject of uh, Creoles in New Orleans and, and race and history in the United States. Um, so today we're going to talk about um, the, the Tignon. And um, we, we probably want to give people a little background that don't know much about the Tignon. But um, so let me give a little background and then I'll, I'll jump into it because, uh, Jeremy, um, you've, you've given us a, uh, and we're going to share a number of pictures that you have in your collection. And we're going to talk about each of those pictures. So uh, you'll be doing most of the talking. So um, the Tignon um, is, a, is obviously a, a, a hair, hair covering that, um, that, Creoles of New Orleans were forced to use in, in 1786 by uh, the governor Esteban Miro. Um, he used the, the Tignon to um, first to insult the free women of color that were there and second to make it very clear uh, that the people that were wearing these uh, Tignons were people of color uh, because uh, during this time Creoles of color were almost indistinguishable from, from the white colonials. Um, and so um, the Tignon sort of became not only uh, a, a sign of, of being a Creole of color, but also uh, um, a, a form of uh, protest and a form of uh, sending messages to people uh, regarding um, your racial designation. So, um, you know, the, the Tignon eventually took on a life of its own and became more of a fashion statement um, and, and became adopted uh, by... Uh, uh, white French women in, in, in France uh, over time. But um, the, the, the first edict of good governance was done in 1786. So that's when we start seeing um, this Tignon sort of um, being worn on a regular basis. So, so Jeremy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slice in the, the, the pictures that we have, and I'll, I'll cut this little portion okay. out. But um, let, let's talk about the, 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 the pictures that um, you sent. And let's start with um, the picture that you sent us uh, that are, are these three women in Tignos. Right, so this is a really interesting um, picture because one, it's about 10 years after uh, the New Orleans of 1786 uh, introduced by Governor Esteban Miro. But these women were likely wearing these Tignos in San Domingue, which is present day Haiti. Uh, way before this. So, you know, uh, the Tion was not invented in New Orleans, okay? It was worn by Creoles, uh, you know, all over. Um, but specifically, uh, the, the, his, the, point, the po importance of this picture is really to show the diverse um, people uh, who were Creoles and uh, also the different style of Tion. So we're, we're going to see a few different styles so far. These are very elaborate. These probably wouldn't have been okay in New Orleans because the whole point of the sumptuary laws was really to limit um, the flashiness of the women of color, the free women of color. They wanted to, to cover them up. They wanted them to kind of uh, be reduced in appearance. Now, what we, we will find out later, of course, that this would not reduce them appearance. And in fact, it became uh, something that even the white Creoles became envious of and adopted. Um, but this is an interesting piece because it's 18th century and it's from San Domingue and uh, very early. And of course, it shows diverse Creole women. And, and so let me ask you something about that. OK, so so you know, for, you know, it's from San Domingue. You know, it's um, pre-1786 when this when this was uh well, uh, right. This law went into uh, uh, in force in in Louisiana and New Orleans. Um, what else do you know about the picture? I mean, uh, it's well, uh, you know, 
Tom. Well, it, it, and it's actually 1796, but we know that they were ha they had these before that. Well, we know it's from Port Out Prince. It's okay. signed. It says Port Out Prince, and we know who the artist is. Someone named, uh, I believe, J T Alexander. Uh, we've done research looking for this artist. We can't really find anything. Um, this is a watercolor and uh, drawing. It's a really interesting painting. I acquired it at our pick was well, painting uh, at an auction, and it's really had a lot of interest, historical uh, interest, and institutional interest. So, so, uh, so, so, Jeremy, the other thing I always want to ask you is this: is that um, you know you're you're an expert on uh, Creole art, um, and you you look for a lot of signs that are inside the paintings. Is there any sure. sign in this in this painting that kind of tells you anything, any information that? Maybe the layman like me would not know. Well, it's interesting. The women are wearing parasols, are holding parasols, which is the umbrella. And uh, it's also shown the exotic fruit. I think what they're trying to convey is they're women of leisure. This parasol, they, they did not want uh, the sun to, you know, uh, burn them up or anything. These women were not used to being in the sun. Yeah. I think it's fair to say they lived a pretty leisurely life. And these are objects that reflect their leisure. And I mean, really, if you look at the fabrics and also the fans, these these women were not uh, working hard. They were uh, they were, I would say, barely working. And that's not to you know undermine what they may have done, but these were not the working class. This was certainly uh, the wealthy. Yeah. And uh, and, and that's and, and we know that there was a wealthy class of uh, free people of color in in Saint Domingue. So it, that that makes a lot of sense. Right. Right, who looked all sorts of ways, and that's kind of what this is showing. It wasn't as color, uh, you know, they, this was not just, uh, you know, color. They were not as color conscious as we believe, and this is conveying that diversity. Exactly, and, and, uh, and I think they brought that consciousness with them to, you know, to uh, New Orleans when they were kicked off the island. That um, you know, oh, yeah. it was more, it was more of a class thing, and uh, who your people were that that made class culture, yeah. class and culture, right? So okay, so we, we, we went through that one. What about right. this, this second one, the woman in, in the purple tignon? I thought that okay. was a pretty interesting picture. Where, where did you pick that up and you know, so, walk us through the picture? Sure, this is a recent acquisition. I actually don't even have this in my possession yet. It's, a, it's, it's being handled in the mail right now. <laughs> but I purchased it out of Tennessee. Um, it's certainly Southern. We don't know too much about the sitter, and perhaps we'll find out more. But what I liked is uh, her tion is not as dressy as some; it's more casual. And my grandmother, when I was talk, when I talk about tions, and and uh, she she called her more casual tion uh, a mouchoir. And we hear this in Louisiana, and we hear it in New Orleans. You know, mouchoir is more of a casual rag. Now it's still a madras pattern, which mm -hmm. is that kind of. Uh, you know that pat that pattern uh, named after uh, India, uh, where where it originates, but it's not as stylized as some of them, and certainly not stylized as next one you're going to see. Okay, and so let me ask you something about that. Okay, so it's not as stylized, and you're saying it's it's from Virginia. Do you think it originated in Virginia, or you just think it got transported to Virginia? Well, I I'm, we're not sure where where it's from. I think it's certainly uh, southern. Okay. And, uh, it's worth more exploration. It's 1880s. The woman appears to be at least 30 years old. She could have been a free woman, but she also could have been enslaved. We don't know much of the details of her life. We do know that it was painted by a lady artist, and I find that interesting that a lady artist decided to paint somebody else who would have been at the time marginalized. Yeah. You know, yeah. and uh, so it's an endearing uh, painting. It's not. Uh, it's not like a lot that we see from the 1880s by white you know, artists. Yeah. Um, and, and so I, I do, I got to ask you about this. You're saying it's, um, you're, you're, you're waiting for it to come in the mail. Are you expecting to find more information when you look at the back of the picture or, um, be actually be able to handle the picture yourself or what, how, I, how would you? Yeah, I fully, I fully, uh, I fully believe I'll find something out. I, I always continue to do research after I find these things. I think that's more fun than that the actual items is when we can find more information about it and when we can put it in that context that it'll be most uh you know uh, historically significant i mean this this piece really is uh, that tignon is just really the way it's made it's really something i've seen quite a bit 
Uh, the next example we'll see is something that you rarely would have seen. I think if you would have gone to New Orleans on a random day, you would have seen more women wearing a form like this than any of the other examples we're going to see. So, so this is this the, the picture with the woman with the little uh, uh, jewel, right? It looks like a brooch, I guess, around, around her neck. Um, and the uh, much higher tignon, um, very nice elaborate. pattern. Um, and, and so uh, I'm going to let you talk about it, and then I got a bunch of questions about it. this so go ahead so this one all we do have the uh, sitter's identity um, and I'll have to look uh, I have to uh, look that up but from what I've been able to discern this lady is not of color but she is from Saint Domingue this was likely done in France but she has these colonial roots in uh, Saint Domingue and this was likely done in the 1830s uh, and she has a very fine tignon, probably made a very expensive fabric, and obviously she's showing off her jewelry. So, uh, again, a woman of privilege, uh, somebody who would never want to have been confused with uh, likely a person of color if she was not one. Um, but here she is. Well, that's, that's, a, that's an interesting point. And, 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 you know, to me, of course, she looks white. But, um, you know, the other side of this is, is is really um, that um, these these creoles even creoles of color uh, certainly uh, had the appearance of looking white and um, so um, to me I, I always think to myself okay well if they're wearing a a, a tignon and the tignon is really a, a a sign to denigrate you and to, and to marginalize you as a person of color uh, I find it very hard to think that white women would adapt this um, this dress especially in Louisiana before right. you know, uh, pre eighteen sixty, um, that they would they would adapt this in any any way, shape, or form, even if it was stylish, um, because they would might they wouldn't want to be you know mis uh, misconstrued to be a person of color. Um, so it is kind of interesting that you say that you know you you're you're expecting that this person was in France, where you know the whole diff there's a whole different attitude as far as that's concerned, right? It doesn't have the stigma that it carried in the United States. Right, perhaps it didn't have the stigma. That it, occur, uh, that, it, that it had in the United States. And, uh, it, but you have to remember something. I think it's important to bring up with these portraits. This is before the day of Instagram and uh, camera phones and even everybody having a camera. So the picture you took or the portrait made of you may be the only one you ever had. So that's important to think about when we see women in this headdress. This is how you were going to be remembered, presumably forever. Mm -hmm. So important that kind of brings it to the next point so you were saying in new orleans there would have been a stigma about this which makes perfect sense but the next sitter is also a white creole and here she is wearing a tignon yeah yeah and this is the older woman that that we're talking about this kind of older in all black yeah in all black and so um uh, so the all black, she's wearing a black tignon, never seen one of those. Um, I know that um, um, my cousin Barbara Trevine wears um, single color tignons sometimes, not multicolored ones. And I've never seen a black tignon. Do you think maybe that's a, a signal that she's in mourning or what, what, what's your uh, take on that? So every time anyone sees uh, a woman in black, they assume she's in mourning. But this one actually is in mourning. <laughs> she, really, she, really, she really is in mourning. Okay, and what's interesting about this particular picture, uh, or this painting, is this is actually posthumous. There are three of these portraits. One in France, uh, in a museum in France. One in a museum in New Orleans. And this one done by the lady's nephew about 20 years later after her death uh, is in my collection. But what's funny is this is the most subdued tion out of all of them. All of the other ones are a little higher, have a little long. So the artist actually kind of played this down. This woman is interesting because she comes from a good, uh, a good family uh, with uh, had some Canary Islander uh, roots, some Spanish roots. It's very uh, just well off. In fact, part of her property, I believe, uh, is actually present day Treme. This is okay. Domingo Litas and. Uh, Really prolific uh, family, important uh, family, and well known. So again, this is the only portrait. There's three versions, but the only portrait of Madame Domingo Fleitas is unusual 
that she would wear this head wrap. And a lot of people have said, well, yeah, but that's probably because they were older ladies and they were losing their hair. Well, here's the magic <laughs> of painting. It's called Photoshop. They did it back then too. <laughs> a woman could have been near bald, but the painter was going to please the patron, so that was no issue at all. If you wanted your nose a little smaller, eyes a little smaller, or your teeth a little more perfect, you know, but which of course, uh, you know, you rarely see teeth. That was no issue at all. So I don't think that's what this is about. I don't know why she's wearing it. This is something we have to learn more about. Um, maybe she just saw this style and it had become fashionable. Um, and uh, out of the, uh, you know, out of the act uh, in 1786, uh, these women wore it and they wore it so well that maybe the white women adopted it and, and uh, you know, didn't think about it, or didn't worry about it. Yeah, maybe it was a, uh, it was a, uh going for fashion over um, attitude. You know what I'm saying? It was just like, hey, um, everybody's, every, this is the fashion and I'm going to wear the fashion whether it, uh, you know, de uh, depicts me as a person of color or not. You know I mean? That's, you know, right. I mean, to me, that's part of the whole idea of uh, using fashion and headdress as kind of a, a political statement. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, you know, I mean... Yeah. And one thing we got to bring up is that uh, in the records, in the colonial records, we have not found any instances of people being punished for wearing a tenure, but we know that, you know, they certainly did. We, uh, and, uh, so that's, that's important. Uh, and maybe as more records become digitized, we'll find instances of that. We don't know how long, for how long or, um, you know, how well these, these were enforced. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, it's something that's worth further study. So if someone knows more about that, please reach out to us. Huh? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the, 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 the whole thing about the, the, the Spanish, obviously, is that they, they didn't enforce, they, they had a lot of uh, laws that they put in place, but they weren't the best at enforcement. Um, right. So, right. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, you know, you start thinking that they did this, but then, you know, they didn't enforce people uh, that were of uh, different races living together, having children, having the children baptized in church. I mean, they, they just really didn't crack down on that in, in a way that, uh, of course, the Americans did later. But um, so they, they were uh, the epitome of laissez-faire. Yeah, they just yeah. let everything happen, and and if somebody was loud enough and it became irritate, you know, irritating, they said, okay, okay, we'll do something. But we don't really know if they didn't just kind of say, okay, okay. So, but that's an interesting thing about this. So, so so uh, the next picture I'll I'll I'll, I'll share with everybody. Is, um, is, is this older woman in a tinya? Um, and, and to me, she, again, she looks white. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking at her, and, you know, it's very hard for me to say, hmm, she looks like she's a Creole of color, a light-skinned Creole of color. Um, so maybe you can tell me about this uh, painting when it was painted, and if you know who the sitter was and just the usual information that you have. Sure. First off, what's really interesting about this painting is the moment you turn it over, it says Paris. So the art, the supplier was in Paris. The canvas came from uh, Paris. It's from 1911. Oh, wow. this, is the newest, this is the newest piece and it, it was in France and it's from 1911. So that's really interesting that we still see this mo uh, Madras pattern. We see this kind of aged woman. And again, you know, we don't know if the woman was of color or if she's just a baby, uh, a woman who remembered her mother putting this on, her grandmother putting this on and was from another colony. Or she could be a New Orleans refugee who was still living. I mean, she's upward in age, so certainly a uh, refugee could have left in the 1860s or 70s and uh, came to France like so many others did. But, you know, that's one of the interesting things about depictions of people of color is a lot of people have this stigma in their mind that they have to look a certain way. Mm -hmm. And I think some of these paintings are hiding in plain sight. Mm -hmm. we, we just don't know who they are. And that's kind of the tragedy of all of these uh, portraits without names. We'll never know who they are. But some of these uh, people of color hide and write in plain sight. And I like this one especially because it's from 1911. It's 20th century. And it still shows this custom prevail. Yeah, and, and you know, uh, we, we know that uh, lots of folks from, from New Orleans uh, had um, uh, connections back in France. Um, right. My relatives went back there uh, regularly, and, and uh, a couple of relatives stayed there for 45 years or so. 
and then returned to New Orleans. Um, so um, there were uh, long-standing relationships of, of Creole of color and white and and white Creoles as well uh, with with France and, and their French uh, relatives. So that that um, that doesn't surprise me. What surprises me is that it's so late. Um, well, yeah. In the in the century, yeah. I mean, that's uh, that to me is super surprising. I'm thinking. I, I think of the Tignard, you know, sort of in that time from the the Spanish control of Louisiana to maybe, you know, uh, the the Civil War. Or so I, I I just I, for some reason or another I, I I feel locked into those that time period. But I you know when you when you when you talk about this, obviously, you know, we're talking about somebody who's wearing a Tignard way out of that um, era that we would think it would be uh, popular. Right. If you see postcards from New Orleans, and, and a famous one is the Pauline or Plaurine, um, which is a or con candy, depending on where you're from, seller. And this is in the 19 teens, and it's a woman of color, uh, and she's still wearing her tignon. So I think uh, a lot of these people were still wearing it. Uh, again, not out of necessity, not out of requirement, but out of something they became accustomed to, become, uh, you know, and, and enjoyed wearing, I think, after a while. So it started out possibly as a symbol of shame became really a, a symbol of uh, uh, resistance and uh, resilience. Yeah, and beauty. I mean, and, you know, oh, absolutely. these women are beautiful, you know, it's a, it goes without saying. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, like I say, it's, it's very interesting to see that, and that, that people uh, just kept that custom alive uh, even long after it was, long after it was a sort of a mandator mandatory, as, as the Spanish would say. So that that's interesting to see that. So, so let me ask you about the the last uh, um, and final piece that you have. It's, it's, a, it's a, a woman of color in a shawl. Um, no tignon, she's not wearing a tignon. Where, where, is that, where is that piece from? So this piece is likely from Santa Mang or possibly even Louisiana. We know it's Empire, so it's right around the year 1810 to 1815, about the range, 1810, 1815. This woman is obviously a woman of African descent, and she's not wearing a tenure, which is interesting. Um, and this this is something that we see also in Louisiana. There are portraits of known free women of color without a tenure. Um, there, you know, granted, this was done in the privacy of a studio, so perhaps in the studio they said, I don't want to wear my tenure. I want to mm -hmm. just show my hair. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know exactly, uh, but it is important to note that just because a woman of color or a woman that you see uh, in these paintings, these 19th century paintings or even late 18th century uh, paintings, just because she's not wearing a tignon does not mean she's not a woman of color. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This yeah. one is a pretty exceptional piece. I mean, really seldom seen, you know, that kind of. Yeah. And I, and I, I wanted to ask you about that. I mean, you're talking about a, a period, you know, 1800, 18, 1815 or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. That's uh, that's very early on, in, in, even in, in in New Orleans history. That's pretty early on. Um, and to to have this picture done, probably, I mean, she was probably a, a woman of means, right? I mean, obviously, to, to yeah. be able to afford to have this miniature done and um, and then have it preserved all this year, all these years, shows something too. Um, where did you where did you discover this or pick this up? I mean, this was also at auction. I spoke to a dealer who was in the UK. Um, now, you know, I don't give too much, uh, you know, credence to when a piece, where a piece is found because pieces travel. I found New Orleans pieces in Scotland. I found New Orleans pieces in, in Mexico. I found them in everywhere. Uh, you know, so this it's not it's not so unusual that a piece uh, travels. But I think one of the reasons why this piece survived is because it was a miniature. Mm -hmm. um, it was easier to keep and uh, it, it was easier to store and uh, easier to keep safe, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a, a, a very, very interesting piece. And I could tell it was old, but I didn't have the, any idea of where, you know, the actual age of it. Pretty, pretty amazing pieces. So, um, so Jeremy, I mean, thank you for, for sharing these, um, these pieces. Um, you know, keep collecting, man. You're doing a you're doing a great service, dude. Um, anything else you want to say um, to kind of close this out? Um, I mean, I, I think you've given us sort of a tour de force of of, of some of the um, background behind the Tignon and some of these pictures. But anything else you want to add? 
Only thing I would add is, uh, you know, we do these videos because we're inter interested in sharing with people, and we also want to hear back from you guys. So if you have a story about a tenuon, you have a picture of a, uh, an ancestor with a tenuon, that's important. And I want to also just mention that the origin of this tenuon is likely African from the African Galay. So it's really this interesting thing that, uh, again, was made or, or in 1786, they said, oh, well, you must wear this to cover your hair. But it was really just a symbol of that uh, African pride again. So I find that interesting. Yeah. And they didn't realize it. <laughs> and it's utilitarian, right? I mean, it, you know, it covers well, your hair. And yeah, I mean, it, it protects you from, it protects your hair from the sun. And there's a lot of different things it does for you. But besides making you look, you know, attractive. Right. Um, so, so yeah, I, I I appreciate that. Okay, so Jeremy, we um, we we've we've actually done one this year, which is we need to do this on a regular basis. So I'm gonna yeah. hold you, I'm gonna hold you to on a monthly basis. Do this. Um, okay. I, I appreciate.